Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the M. Lewis Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program. great crowd and I really appreciate that and today's talk is about light and semiconductor devices so as an introduction and as overview of what I'm going to talk about I'm going to talk about a, uh, a few different subjects so uh, the first subject is how important semiconductors are to today's technology um, semiconductor devices are in our computer microprocessors in solar cells and in our digital camera sensors and without semiconductor technology these devices would not exist as, as they do today um, so in today's talk, we'll examine the role that light plays both in um, making and better understanding these devices and in developing new technologies that we're working on at um, Michigan and researchers are working on around the world. And these new semiconductor light sources and detectors could enable faster communications and data transfer. So the first question you may be asking is what, what is a semiconductor? Well, one definition is that it just has a conductivity between a metal and an insulator, which is true. If you measure its resistance, it's behaved somewhere between a conductor like a metal wire and an insulator, something like glass or plastic. And in order to understand what makes some materials semiconductors, because we know that all materials are made out of basically the same stuff, atoms and electrons, or if you want to get fancy, quarks and leptons, um, what makes some of them behave like semiconductors. And so it's instructive to look at examples of materials that are semiconductors and see if they fit any pattern. So um, a few semiconductors I've listed here, um, for instance, silicon, uh, which is the basis of most of today's computer technology, germanium, gallium arsenide, indium phosphide, cadmium telluride. These are just a few examples of, of semiconductor materials. So what do these materials have in common? Well, if we want to examine what makes certain materials semiconductors, we can look at the periodic table because we know that atoms or elements um, in the same column, so in chemistry we learn that uh, elements that are in the same column of the periodic table, they exhibit similar behavior. So for instance, uh, column one, the group one elements, includes the alkali metals, and column eight includes the noble gases. They're called noble because they don't really like to form chemical reactions with anything, and that's because in chemistry you learn that there are basically eight valence electrons, so that the group eight elements have a closed shell configuration, so they don't have available states for additional electrons. And if we look at this table, we can find that silicon is here as a group four element. Similarly, germanium is right below it. It's also a group four element. Another example, gallium arsenide has Gallium, which is a group three element, and arsenic, which is a group five. Indium phosphide, another example, is also has one element in group three and one element in group five. And cadmium telluride, um, the last example on my list, is a little bit different, but it has basically cadmium, a group kind of has two uh, valence electrons, and, and tellurium, which has six valence electrons. And, okay, so if we uh, lump these into categories. We have a couple of elements that form group four semiconductors. These are the three five semiconductors, and cadmium telluride is an example of a two six semiconductor. And many semiconductors fall within this category. Okay, so now we have a pattern. Um, what does this tell us about, about why these materials would form semiconductors and not metals? So in chemistry, um, the group four elements have four valence electrons. And each atom then has, uh, would like to make four covalent bonds to other atoms. And one example of this is carbon, a group four element, will form four bonds with hydrogen atoms, and this makes the molecule methane. And for this element, for this molecule, these four bonds, it forms the shape of a tetrahedron. So these bonds, um, if you kind of look at it, a tetrahedron has uh, four triangular sides. 
And if you look at the structure of diamond or silicon or germanium, it forms this crystal structure on the right, where each atom in the crystal has four neighboring atoms, four, forms four bonds, which have the same angle between their bonds as the methane molecule. So uh, that explains the bonding that silicon has. What about its electrical properties? So um, in pure semiconductors, so something that's all silicon atoms or all germanium atoms, uh, all of the valence electrons are localized. They're, they're in these molecular bonds. And at very low temperatures, these materials will, will act like insulators. However, at some higher temperatures, at some finite temperatures, some of these electrons will become delocalized and then they can conduct. So at low temperatures, they're all in these molecular bonds. At some finite temperature, some of the electrons will be excited into uh, what's called a conduction band, and those delocalized electrons then are free to move throughout the crystal. So this brings us to our first question. Well, this is the mystery of holes in semiconductors. And this mystery is basically, well, what happened to the space that that electron left behind? If it became excited and it move to a higher energy level so that it's free to move. What happened to the bond or the, the space that it had behind? And the answer is very interesting. It turns out that these holes, these missing spaces, also con uh, contribute to the electrical conductivity. And a good way to see that is if I have a cartoon picture. This is my, my red circles are my silicon atoms. And I have these yellow bonds. These are basically where kind of a, a pic cartoon picture of, of the bonds between the silicon atoms. And you can see that each one has four electrons, four bonds that it shares with four neighboring atoms. And so there are two shared between each pair. And if I had one bond missing, basically the electron that was in this bond leaves behind a hole. Um, and this is the electron. Now when I apply an electric field, both this electron and this empty space can move. And so one way to think about it, um, I mean, so this is pretty neat. Um, they both contribute to the current. So the electron moves to the left and this hole moves to the right. You can think about um, your, your water bottle. If you have a water bottle and you fill it almost all the way up, except you leave a little gap. So you leave a little bubble. If you, if you move the water bottle, you can see those bubbles move and they move in the opposite direction that, that the water would move due to gravity. The, the holes, the bubbles tend to float upwards. So it's similar with this holes and electrons. And um, can also change the electrical properties of a semiconductor by adding impurities. So I talked about the case when you have all silicon atoms, but what if you had a group five element like phosphorus inside your crystal? Does it look any different? Well, look, an extra electron. So phosphorus is, is a group five element and it has five valence electrons. And so it can still form four bonds and then it'll have one electron left over. And so um, in this material with the phosphorus impurity, you can still get conduction at, at low temperatures. And so this creates what is called an n-type material or an electron-doped material because there are extra electrons in the material. And similarly, we could imagine uh, putting in a group three element, so one that only had three valence electrons, and this would create what is called a p-type or hole-doped material because there would be extra holes, basically these spaces that could s contribute to the conduction. So the advantages of semiconductors and why they're so useful for devices is because they have these tunable electrical properties. Basically by changing, carefully changing the number of impurities and the type of impurities in the material, we can create devices that have um, the electrical properties that are useful for logic, for transistors, and for gain. So uh, the other main advantage of semiconductors and why they beat out their competition is that there, it turns out that it is very easy to make many devices on semiconductors and to make them very small. And so we can pack a lot of these devices together to do something um, like um, you know, play video games on our computer. And we'll talk more about that later. And so the, the first thing that I wanted to do is then, well, you know, what, what was the main competition? Let, let's check it out.
So, so the main con competition before solid state devices were vacuum tubes. And uh, in, for a vacuum tube, we have a high voltage applied between two metal plates. I, I don't have a vacuum tube, but I have something very similar. So um, this plastic tube is a, a, uh, a discharge tube. It has two metal electrodes at either end. And we're going to apply this high voltage. And when I turn this on, I have to be very careful not to touch anything. And it looks like Warren did a good job of protecting me from myself <laughs> so I won't accidentally electrocute myself. So I um, guess I should first turn on the camera. So we may have to dim the lights to see this. So the first thing that I'll do is I'll turn on the high voltage source. And then I'll turn on the pump to start pumping on this vacuum tube. So the high voltage source will cause electrons to flow through this tube. And when it gets to low enough pressure, that, that current can flow. And you can see it's a nice pink glow now. Um, this is due to the, the nitrogen atoms in the gas that we're pumping out. So we started off with this tube full of air. And now we're getting to a nice white color, which is the, the oxygen atoms. And if I put this um, magnet here, you can see the, you can see this, um, is the, the line basically split. And that's because the magnetic field exerts a force on the electrons. And in this case, we have an AC, um, we have an AC voltage. And so we have electrons both traveling to the left and traveling to the right. And so each of those gets deflected in a, in a different direction. And that's why we see two branches here. I think that's a, that's a pretty nice demo. Does it look OK up there? Yeah. OK. In this gas discharge tube, we have the two metal electrodes and the electrons flowing through the tube. And a, vac a vacuum tube um, works very similarly, except that they tended to use, um, for their electron source, they used a heated anode or, or a filament, like a light bulb. And so it would boil off the electrons. And the advantage of doing that, um, using the vacuum tube that way, is that basically you would make um, what is called a diode. So the electrons could only flow from the heated filament to the, the positively charged plate, and you couldn't get any flow the other way because the other, um, the other, other the, the cathode was basically cold. So it, it, it wouldn't be a source of electrons because it wasn't heated. And so, um, but in this case, we have an AC voltage source, so electrons can flow in both directions. So the plates alternate between being the cathode and being the anode. And so um, in, in vacuum tubes, um, what gives you gain is that you could basically use a third electrode um, to control the current between your anode and your cathode. And this would give you um, what is known as a, a triode. And so you could put a small signal on that third um, contact and basically control the larger current um, between your, your main tube, your source, and your drain. And that's similar to how a transistor works and why we get gain. We basically have um, some source drain current or voltage, which can be modulated by a, by a smaller input current or voltage. So um, a natural question to ask then is, well, what, what made the tube glow? And uh, the answer to that is that um, the electrons collide with the atoms in the gas that are in that tube, and they excite those atoms, or ions. And so um, this <clears throat> pink circle is a schematic of maybe the electron orbital for an excited gas atom. And then when that atom relaxes, or when the um, electrons in the atom uh, go to the ground state, we have what is the gas in a lower energy electron orbital. And what popped out, if you were watching carefully, is, is a photon, is basically a quantized amount of energy as light of an electromagnetic wave. And th the energy of this photon is exactly related to the difference in energy between that excited atom and the lower energy state. And that is inversely proportional to lambda, which is the wavelength of, of the light. And so the, the color of the light is directly related to the energy transitions of the gas. 
So transitions between different energy states of the atom or molecule um, will give us the nice pink glow or the nice white glow that we saw from the nitrogen and from the oxygen glass, gas. Okay, so it's natural then to ask a similar question about semiconductors. What, what happens if we have um, this, at finite temperatures, I mentioned that we could have these delocalized electrons that aren't in these bonds and we could have some missing electron states or, or holes. So it turns out when this electron goes back to the hole so that it forms the chem that molecular bond, it, it, um, it's at a lower energy state and that, ener that difference in energy also corresponds to a photon or a particular wavelength of light that is emitted. And the wavelength of this emitted light then depends on the energy levels of the semiconductor, basically how much energy it takes to um, take an electron from being in the, the valence bonds, chemical bonds, to being in the conduction band, to being a delocalized electron. And a natural question is how much can we, light can we really get from, from, from such a thing? And, and what color light what might we expect? So, and I switched to this green laser pointer because it turns out that this green laser pointer actually works from, uh, it's also a semiconductor device. So it uses the semiconductor aluminum gallium arsenide. And this aluminum gallium arsenide uh, emits somewhere in the infrared wavelength range. Uh, however, it's actually a, a pretty complicated process. It seems very indirect um, and maybe not as efficient as this device could be because it, it takes so many different steps. So the first step is we have infrared aluminum gallium arsenide material that emits in the infrared. And then this light is then used to pump some crystal which emits at 1064 nanometers. And then that light in turn is frequency doubled um, through a nonlinear optical process through to this wavelength of 532 nanometers. And the neat thing and the reason I wanted to, to mention this, this process is because this frequency doubling was actually discovered in the Randall Laboratories across the way um, here at the University of Michigan in 1961 um, by physicists uh, Franken, um, Hill, Peters, and Weinreich. So it's pr pr pretty neat that um, that history ties into a technology that is pretty commonplace today. So the other question I wanted to ask is, well, what, what wavelengths can we get from different semiconductors? And as I mentioned, it depends on the, it depends on the material. Uh, however, there are a lot of different semiconductors. So this chart is basically, um, you see labels like um, here we have silicon, germanium, gallium arsenide, and I think I mentioned cadmium telluride. Um, as examples, indium phosphide, as examples of, of different semiconductors. And on the y-axis, vertically, we have a plot of either gap energy, which is inversely related to the wavelength. So both of those are shown. There's a, a bright colorful band basically indicating the range of visible wavelengths. And so you can get an idea of the scale. And so you can see that we have materials um, like gallium nitride, that are close to the ultraviolet range, and indium nitride that is square in the visible. And the other thing you can see in this plot um, is, so the x-axis is, is lattice constant. That basically has to do with the spacing of the atoms in the crystal. And um, in addition, you can see that between some materials there are these black lines. And those black lines basically indicate, well, what happens if if I made an alloy, so instead of having only gallium and nitrogen atoms or only indium and nitrogen atoms, if I made something that had nitrogen atoms and then I, I split 50-50 between gallium and in indium atoms. So that would be some sort of tertiary alloy because it contains all three elements, gallium, indium, and, and nitrogen. And the properties of that material would lie somewhere along this black line between gallium nitride in, and indium nitride. So you can see that by um, you, can, you can make alloys of these materials to get properties. So if you wanted to make a nice blue laser, you could, um, for, for your Blu-ray reader, you could um, use some combination of gallium, indium, and aluminum nitride to ach achieve that wavelength. 
And, and so that's uh, what material scientists and engineers use to, to um, make semiconductor devices that emit at wavelengths um, throughout the visible range. Um, the infrared range is also very useful um, if you wanted to do some thermal imaging or make some night vision goggles. Um, so um, we need, a, because the optical properties of the material depend on, the, um, on what the material is, we need a, a wide range. We need to look at many different semiconductors in order to um, have this flexibility of, of having light sources at, at different wavelengths. And a good question then to ask is, uh, does the reverse process work? And uh, if, if we put in a photon, if we put in some light which has a wavelength corresponding to an energy that's greater than the energy gap from that previous plot, we create an electron in hole. We excite an electron from um, its molecular bond to being a delocalized electron. And then if we were to apply an electric field, we would see a current. We'd basically see electrons and holes moving. And this is the, and this leads to a current if we had a, an applied voltage applied across the semiconductor. Okay. Okay, I just needed to press that harder. Okay, so that brings us to our, our next demo. So, um, we're converting light into electricity, and this is basically the principle behind a solar cell. So here we have a pretty nice solar cell. It's flexible. It's made from unisolar, and it's, it's based on silicon, and it's connected to um, a milliammeter, which I shouldn't move too much, which you can read on, on, on the center screen. You can see that if it's a cloudy day, we get less current, and then if if we uh, turn the lights back on and it's a nice sunny day, we get some current, which we can then use to power our devices in, in our house. So this is, this is a, a solar cell that, that works, um, that basically uses semiconductor technology, in this case, silicon. So, so solar cells convert light into electricity. And since silicon is relatively abundant and um, inexpensive, and absorbs visible and, and near infrared light. So one reason, one way that you know that silicon is so abundant is silicon oxide is basically, well, it's either glass or sand. And so in a sense, silicon is, is um, almost everywhere on our Earth's surface. And so it's, it's relatively easy to find and then um, refine silicon. And in, um, you could potentially get higher efficiencies um, with devices using uh, other semiconductors, but those are uh, more expensive currently to produce. So um, that brings us to the question then of, of making semiconductor devices. So the question is, if I have a semiconductor, how do I go about applying wires to it so that I, I can collect the current or apply the voltages? I guess an even bigger question is, the solar cell seems like a relatively um, simple device, but what about something more complex, like a computer, where we know that we have billions of transistors, or even our megapixel cameras, where we have millions of devices? How do, how do we define individual pixels? And so um, that tells us that there must be some efficient way to make all of these devices somehow together at, at once and in parallel. And it turns out that light also plays a role in the making of these devices. And basically, um, we use the technique of photolithography in order to transfer patterns onto a, a, a semiconductor chip, and that's done using light. And it's, it's a principle similar to photography. Basically, we have a light-sensitive material, which we call photoresist, and we can spin it onto a, a, our semiconductor wafer or chip. And um, when we went and first uh, we have to start off with a master pattern or a mold. And basically this consists of a glass plate shown as this blue rectangle. And then it has um, these, the pattern which is present um, as this black, black uh, which basically represents um, you might have some sort of metal mask. Because basically you want to be able to expose some areas to light while blocking light from other areas of your semiconductor chip. And so this is done, you bring the mask 
Um, well, one, one way to do this is you bring your mask into contact with your semiconductor with photoresist on top. And then the next thing you do is that you have to expose this to light. So you have to expose some of the resist to light. So you might have an ultraviolet light source. And when that light source is present, it changes the chemistry of this photoresist. So this photoresist is typically some sort of plastic or polymer. And when it's hit with light, it somehow changes the, the plastic. And so it, it changes this photoresist polymer. And then the next thing we can do is we can take the, the wafer away from um, out, and then we can place it in some developer solution. And the idea is that in the developer solution, it's designed so that the parts that were exposed to light will dissolve, and the, the part that um, or the part that wasn't exposed to light would dissolve, and the part that was exposed to light will remain on, on the semiconductor chip. And so then the next step is that you can do whatever you need to do, add the wires or define your pixels or, or make, um, do the um, doping, that electrical doping that you need to make your transistor. And uh, you can do it so that you're only doing it on the areas that are open, that aren't covered by the resist, while leaving areas that were protected by the resist unchanged. So I have a couple of examples here of some uh, semiconductor devices. So we have a microscope here and also uh, this uh, doc document camera. And so we can see um, under this microscope, we can, we can translate this. So after the talk, you can come in and play with this if you like, basically. Um, you can see how, how um, how this microprocessor works. And, and you can see that the pattern is pretty intricate. It has many layers. It has many layers. It has many layers of wires. It has many layers of different semiconductor layer of different semiconductors. And, um, and you can see you have a, a label here so that you can, if you mix up your chips, you can, you can figure out which one you have under the microscope. It's the MC680-30. And then here, as to give you some idea of the scale, under the document camera, we have a nickel and we have some, um, some processors. You can see, so those, you can see the pins that are needed to, to wire, uh, to make electrical connections to this processor. So many, many wires go into this thing. Okay, another example of a semiconductor device is, uh, this is an image of, uh, of a CCD, a charge coupled device. And this is used in astronomy. So I pulled this off of some astronomy website. And it's particularly notable because uh, the 2000 Nobel Prize was shared in part by, uh, in physics, uh, to Willard S. Boyle and George E. Smith for the invention of an imaging semiconductor cir circuit, basically the CCD sensor. And it's um, amazing technology. It's present in your digital cameras. And uh, what, what is really amazing about it is that it's, it's really been our eyes um, in space. The, this is an image from the Hubble telescope um, taking with, taken with such a device. And so um, not only is it nice for taking snapshots of our friends and family, but it also has allowed uh, for some amazing science. And this provides a somewhat nice segue then to uh, my other topic, which at first seems unrelated, basically the transmission of light and fibers. However, it is somewhat related, um, somewhat pretty nicely, in fact, because the 2000 Nobel Prize was also shared by Charles Cow for his groundbreaking achievement uh, concerning the transmission of light and fibers for optical communication. And a natural question to ask is, well, how, how widespread are these fibers? Are, are they really useful? Well, they're incredibly useful. It's estimated that 99% of the data communicated around the world is sent through optical fibers. Only 1% or so is sent by satellite. And here's a map from Alcatel, basically showing um, the undersea cables that are connecting continents and transferring data around the world. And um, you really notice this. Uh, for example, in 2006, there was an earthquake in Taiwan, and that um, 
damaged a few undersea cables and, and was, was a very noticeable effect um, in terms of transmitting data uh, to people around the world. Um, so we really become extremely reliant on, on these cables to transmit uh, data between continents. And a natural question is, how do these fibers work? It seems pretty amazing that you can use uh, something to guide light um, under the ocean, and, and it is. And the basic principle behind it is um, total internal reflection. So we have a, an interface where we have um, two materials, or it can be a material in air, which have a difference index and refraction. And from Snell's law, we can, we can uh, determine the, the angles at which um, the rays would be refracted. So similar to how um, if you're looking at a, a pencil in a glass of water, the pencil looks bent because the rays of light are bent. And so the rays of light can actually become bent enough. So here uh, in, this, in uh, ray two, it's somewhat bent. In ray three, it's so bent so that um, this, this ray going into the, the upper material is bent by 90 degrees. And if you exceed that critical angle, the, the light will be totally internally reflected. It won't be able to leave the bottom material and it'll be, um, and, and move into the top material. So we have a, a nice demonstration of that here. Uh, if I turn on this laser, and I think we might need to dim the lights to see this a little better. Thanks, Warren. So you can see that this is um, a, a piece of plastic and the, the green light, I can hold my hand or I can use a piece of paper above or below it. You can see that there, there's not much green light that escapes from the top or the bottom. It just reflects and stays inside the plastic. And it's pretty amazing because, so there's, there's no mirrors. So I, I can show you this is a, a smaller piece. There, there's no mirrors on, on this piece of plastic. And, but you can see it, just, it probably looks pretty bright. If I align this just right, you can see most of the light. If I get it at that critical angle, then it'll, then it'll uh, just be guided inside this piece of plastic. So a natural question then is what, I mean, how do, how do these cables end up being so useful? Uh, why, why are they so good at transmitting all of this data? And the reason for that is because, well, for one thing, um, we can modulate the light at much faster frequencies than we can electrical signals and end up with less loss. So with electrical wires, if you start, um, if, if you start going to higher frequencies, uh, you, you end up with heating of the wire and that translates to loss of your, of your signal. Uh, however, these fibers are extremely low loss. Light can travel through them for kilometers. This is why they're useful for spanning things that are really large like oceans and uh, you, don't, you don't lose very much of your signal. So if you're traveling under a large ocean, you do need to have, um, you, you do need to occasionally have what are called repeaters to basically re-amplify your signal. But it, it, I mean, it's still a fairly low loss um, throughout the cable. And um, so for long distances, these modern fibers have, have extremely low loss and um, the other advantage of using optics is you can imagine that I could use different wavelengths of light to represent different signal channels. So let's say um, I have an apartment building or something, I have some, and everybody is having a separate telephone conversation. So each telephone conversation could be represented on a different color of light. So somebody could be speaking um, on, the, on, a, on a signal that's basically red light that's modulated on and off. So basically your data would be represented by either the um, red light on or red light off. And then your neighbor in the neighboring apartment could be using an orange channel and, um, and so forth. And so because uh, you can also represent your information on different wavelengths of light, you also get um, these additional channels. And so your, your total data throughput is much higher than if you only had one, one channel to, to basically communicate on. And so, um, however, there are some challenges for optics. So you probably noticed that you still pro use electrical wires throughout most of your house. 
and not fibers, despite the advantages that they have. And that's because the current optical si systems are, are larger and, and more expensive than um, just plugging in electrical wires to each other. Um, but um, although these, um, well, for long distance communications, the, the advantages of having the high data throughput outweigh the disadvantages of putting together an optical system. Um, the technology does need to become more compact and less expensive before we can use it uh, to transmit data, for example, uh, to our homes. And uh, one solution is to look towards building on-ship optical electro uh, optoelectronic devices. So the same way that we can make um, billions of devices on parallel in a microprocessor, it would be nice if we can make billions of optical devices in parallel on a microprocessor as well. And then we would have a way of, of um, making those components um, in parallel and in a less expensive and in a more compact way. So this brings me to my uh, final topic, which is using light as a research tool for semiconductor devices. And um, as since we have this relationship between the energy levels of a semiconductor and, and light, we already, uh, we can do measurements such as optical spectroscopy to tell us about the energy levels of a semiconductor. Basically, the way this measurement works is we um, shine light above the band gap on our semiconductor material, and then we look at what wavelengths of light are emitted from it. Or we can do an absorption measurement where we change the wavelengths of light that we're sending into the material and see what wavelengths are absorbed. And those correspond to the energy transitions in the semiconductor. And um, what uh, my research is particularly interested in is that if we look at the polarization of the light as well, we can learn something about the electron spin. And all electrons have spin. There are two types of spin, spin up and spin down. And um, there's been some recent interest in uh, studying spins in semiconductors because current devices just rely on the charge of electrons, so how fast the electrons are moving. And they're not really concerned with which direction the spin is pointed. Um, however, you could imagine that instead of a transistor that works on changing the amount, the number of electrons, or how fast they're moving, you could have a device that basically looks at the direction of the spins of the electrons. And that could have some advantages. Uh, for instance, in magnetic materials, such as how information is um, stored in hard drives, um, magnets have, have um, spin-polarized electrons. And so there could be ways of reading information from magnetic hard drives without having to spin your hard drive up and worry about your hard disk crashing uh, if you could just measure it electronically. So that's something that we're interested in. And it turns out that the polarization of light determines whether we excite, spin up, or spin down electrons. So if we have our, our light and it's polarized in a certain way, we can end up um, exciting electrons that are uh, predominantly of one spin polarization. And similarly, um, that also has an effect on other optical properties that we can also then use to measure the direction of electron spins in, in some material. So um, in, in my research group, uh, we're also interested in, in looking at these processes. Some of them happen very quickly. And um, quick is good because um, your, your, your two gigabits, uh, gigahertz processor works a lot faster than your megahertz um, processor. So if faster processes, in a sense, um, allow us to tr transfer data faster and allow us to do computations faster. So we are interested in, in fast processes. And the question is, if we want to measure something that happens really fast, how do we do that? How do we take a very fast snapshot of something? And I mean, so let's say, imagine you're, you're um, trying to take a picture of something that happens really fast, like somebody taking a, a, um, a shot on, on goal or something. And to some extent, you could use a faster shutter, so you could, you know, Basically, um, your camera, you could change the shutter speed so it was faster. But what if you wanted to measure something that was super, super fast? And one way to do that, um, which was used to take pictures, um, have any of you seen the picture of, of a bullet going through an apple? Now, that's a pretty amazing picture. 
and they used uh, strobe photography. So instead of turning the shutter on and on, off really fast, they, they sit in a dark room. And then they use a strobe light that's synchronized to the bullet somehow. Um, and when the light is on, that's basically um, what the film can see. So the, film, the photographic film is only sensitive to light. And so if the light is on and off very fast, it only sees um, what happened when the light was on for that fraction of a second. And so we have a, a nice demonstration here that Warren set up. So we have this, this uh, fan with uh, a few, few colored blades. And I'm going to turn on this fan. It's going to spin pretty fast. OK, so who remembers what color the blades were in and, and what? OK, and what order they were in? Well, um, we don't have to remember. We can actually just look at it. So if I turn on the strobe light, there we go. So we can kind of take a, a freeze shot of this fan. So don't worry, it's still moving. If I put this paper in there. <laughs> you can play with the timing of the strobe a little bit so we can get, oh, there's nice. We kind of froze all four colors at once. So we can turn this off. And the strobe light works pretty well for this fan. And um, with the lasers we have in, in, in research labs, we can achieve even shorter pulses. We can look at things that happen on the picosecond time scale, so 10 to the minus 12 seconds. That's many fractions of a second. And uh, femtosecond time scale, so 10 to the minus 15. Or even the attosecond time scale, so 10 to the minus 18. Things that happen on, on the 10 to the minus 18 second time scale. And uh, the way our ultra-fast spin measurements work is we basically use a pulse of light to excite electron spins. So this is the, the first pulse of light that creates a spin polarization. So now we have electrons that are spin polarized in one direction. And then we follow that pulse with a second pulse after some time delay later. And the second pulse we measure, and that second pulse measures, performs the measurement. And so it only interacts with the sample for the time that it's passing through it. And then we get our time resolved signal by basically varying the time between that first pulse and between the second pulse. And so by changing that time delay, we can map out what happens to the system as a function of time. So this is a picture of, of our optics lab. Uh, we have um, our sample is, is sitting inside a cryostat between the poles of an electric electro, electromagnet. And we have a lot of um, mirrors and lenses to basically um, bounce the beam around and then send it to, to our sample. And at some point, um, in order to get the, in order to change the time delay between the first and the second pulse, um, we, we send one pulse to an optical delay line which is shown here. And you can see there's a cable chain that's computer controlled by a stepper, there's a computer controlled stepper motor, which basically allows us to change that, the length of this, this optical path. And since the speed of light is constant, then that changes the time it takes for the light to travel to the sample. So the light travels through some path and then eventually travels through the sample. And so this is an example of some of our measurement. So time zero corresponds to when those two pulses were, were, um, hit the sample at the same time. So there we see a, a spike corresponding to when the electron spins were first polarized. And then by changing the time delay, we can see this, we can see this decay. We can see how the spin polarization changes with time. And we change this time scale over a few nanoseconds. And this measurement was taken at the nice uh, temperature of, of 30 Kelvin. And this electron spin polarization measurement, um, I've changed this y-axis here. It also corresponds to a Faraday rotation measurement, because that's actually what we measure of the second pulse um, that tells us about the electron spin polarization. So that brings me to my last demonstration on Faraday rotation. And I wanted to thank uh, Warren and the demo lab for hauling this huge magnet out of, of storage. Um, so this is 
This is our Faraday rotation demonstration. Uh, so it's, it's based on this effect that Michael Faraday discovered that he could control the polarization of light through a material using a magnetic field. And in our measurement, in our experiment, we basically have um, some ethyl alcohol. This is our material. And we have a green laser pointer that um, the green laser is, is linearly polarized and it travels through, through, there's some holes in this electromagnet so that it can travel through the pole pieces and then out the other side. And then it's, it's hitting that wall, so be careful not to step into the path of this green laser. Um, so maybe you can see it over there, or we might have to dim the lights. Okay, so a little bit more about this um, experiment. So this is a, a large electromagnet. It can reach fields of, of two Tesla. So that's a pretty respectable magnetic field. Um, on the other hand, you might remember that the Earth's field is, is on the order of one one thousandth of a Tesla. So two Teslas is a pretty large magnetic field. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to um, look at the brightness of that light because there, at the other side of the electromagnet, there's another linear polarizer. And so basically what will happen is this linearly polarized light, if it travels through a linear polarized, if it's the same polarization as the second linear polarizer, all of it will travel through. And if it's somehow at cross polarizations, some of the light will get blocked. And so by, by looking at the intensity of the light on the other side, we can know whether, um, whether the polarization of the light going through that analyzer has changed. And what we're going to do is, this is an electromagnet, so I'm going to turn on this power supply. It takes a couple seconds to warm up, and then there's, this, uh, there, there's a, a relay switch, and then the magnet will turn on. And when that happens, we should see a change in the intensity of the light on the other side. So let's dim that, and we'll... Okay, let's give everybody uh, okay. maybe 10 seconds for your eyes to adjust. Oh, we might have to dim the... Oh, the lectern as well? Okay, I can do that. Now we can't see anything. <laughs> That's the idea. Okay. Uh, okay. Everybody see the green blob on the wall? Okay. I found the on button, so I'm going to. Why don't you remove the uh, source first, just to show them? Okay, sure. So if, if I remove the the the, the cell. So it changes the brightness a little bit, the cell, because the cell has, a, you know, the cell is, is made out of glass, so there's some um, reflections at the, at the front and back surface. So it does, it does change the brightness by a little bit. And now we're gonna see what, how that changes uh, as compared to when this magnet is on. So everybody ready? Okay. There we go. So it, it dims the intensity. It changes the linear polarization so that it no longer goes through that um, through the analyzer. Okay, so let's see what happens when I remove this substance. Uh, so now it's it's dim when the when the cell is inside when we have the ethyl alcohol when the light is traveling through the ethyl alcohol in the cell and it's it's bright when I remove the cell and it, it's a much larger difference. Well. I should ask you, does it seem like a larger difference? Okay, than when the, um, than when the magnet was off. So, that, so that this, is the, this is the Faraday effect, that the magnetic field through the material changes the linear polarization of the light traveling through it. And um, you can imagine that one way to uh, send a signal, so if I'm Paul Revere or I'm looking for a signal, you know, one, one if I land, two if I see, or if anybody knows um, Morse code, unfortunately I don't, because I, I know SOS, but that's, that's about it. Uh, this could be an example of, of data that we're sending by light that could then be sent through, through a fiber and then sent to other continents. Um, but it seems somewhat awkward. We have to use this large two Tesla magnet and we're reliant on either um, pulling this cell in, in or out of this magnetic field. So I'll turn that off. Since we know that the electron spin polarization can also be used to create a Faraday effect of sorts based on electron spin polarization, if we can, ch if we can control that electron spin polarization through electrical means, we have another way of controlling an optical signal. And so um, 
we're, we're working on this problem of controlling electron spin polarization in materials to have some effect on, um, on the data that you could transmit as light or uh, to look at spin polarized electron currents. So with that, I wanted to thank you for your attention. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the M. Lewis Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program.